Good morning. Nice crowd out here this morning, so thanks for taking the time out of your uh, our busy days and morning to join us to talk about uh, this, this aircraft and a little bit of the uh, foundation. We'll get that to a little bit, uh, a little bit um, during the presentation uh, that laid the foundation for the unleashing of this beast. There was a, there used to be this show on the History Channel that was titled, I think, Man, Moment, Machine, where they went back in history and where did those three things come together at the right time, the right place? Well, this is a great example. We're gonna talk about the man and a little bit about the men who sat in this thing. And then we have this airplane we have this concept that turned into reality called the Fast Carrier Task Force. And the moment was the war in the Pacific. Um, so yeah, a very short yet very successful and a very violent career uh, for this airplane behind me. So let's get moving. Okay, here's our agenda. You can follow this through the program. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the late design changes in the design and development of the airplane that came from early war, lessons learned. We're then going to roll into the key aerial battles where, uh, not initially, we're not going to go all the way to the end of the war, but we're going to talk about those key early aerial battles where the fast carrier task force really showed its mettle and showed how a great concept uh, it was and how that developed into actual execution out in the field. And like I kind of mentioned, it enabled the unleashing of this beast back here. Okay, uh, we were also able just a couple weeks ago uh, to take the Hellcat to an air show outside Atlanta, Georgia. And yes, that was a trek. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Just, uh, it was a great event. Hellcat was magnificent, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, then a little bit of Q&A. I hope that takes about an hour, and then about 12 o'clock, you guys are uh, free to do what you want. We hope you'll take advantage of being here and check out all the other displays and artifacts we have. We have plenty of other airplanes here. We have the Hellcat. Love for you guys to take a look over here. We have one of the wings folded, one of the wings behind me spread, is the terminology that's used of fascinating engineering that went into this. And I want you to keep in mind that on a carrier, during World War II, on a pitching carrier deck, young men would fold and spread those wings with the engine running. So let's get right into this presentation. That's me, I'm Rob. Uh, that's our Min-C3. Uh, we're, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Commander David McCampbell. He was the highest scoring Navy ace of the war. And we have painted this airplane uh, after what his looked like, and he named it after his wife. So Min C3, yes, there was a Min C1 and a Min C2. And now we're at Min C3, and so that's what we have this uh, painted at. And if you take advantage and look at the top of the vertical tail, it's got C-A-G. Okay, Commander Air Group. And McCampbell was, by the time of his last sorties, was the commander of Air Group 15. Okay, so some late design changes. Interesting combination of myth and non-myth that the Hellcat was designed specifically to defeat the Zero. Well, yes and no. No, if you look at that first bullet, Grumman was working already working on their successor to the F4F Wildcat in 1938. Well, before we really knew about the Zero, we certainly hadn't fought the Zero by then, but the Hellcat was on the drawing board in 1938. But the yes part of that myth was um, in early 1942, after some of the early battles where our F4Fs were fighting the Zeros, the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics visited Grumman, as did Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare. Uh, O'Hare Airport in Chicago, big airport named after this gentleman. Subsequent to his visit, 
during the Guadalcanal campaign, flying F4F Wildcats, he was awarded the Medal of Honor for his, um, his actions during the Guadalcanal campaign. So anyway, you combine those two things, you can see what Butch O'Hare told the engineers was, we need the, an airplane though that can go upstairs faster, climb faster, and get up there right now. So what did they do? One thing they did, they originally had a 1700 horsepower R2600, they bumped it up and they went to that venerable R2800 by Pratt & Whitney, 2000 horsepower, so they added power. They also, O'Hare said, hey, let's give these guys better visibility. So they raised the cockpit in the fuselage. They raised it. So that resulted in one, it kind of, it's hard to see in this photo on the bottom, it kind of uh, led to a sloping cowling from the windscreen in front of the pilot down to the engine. And it raised it up and it gave the pilot much better visibility than they had in the Wildcat. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some of the key aerial battles that uh, the Hellcat participated in and uh, ran up its score. And uh, here's a big picture map that we'll go through. Hawaii's over here, right off the map. Here's Midway coming down here. Here's the Guadalcanal is down here on the bottom. The Hellcat was not around by the time of the Guadalcanal campaign, August 42, February to 43. We didn't have the Hellcat by then. So here's New Guinea, Rabaul was a huge thing, um, and we're going to talk more about here's the Central Pacific Navy campaign coming up, the Marshall Islands, Anahuita, Kwajalein, here's Guam, Tinian, and Saipan, those are the Marianas, Truk, Peleliu, here's the Philippines, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and then the mainlands. We're going to start at Rabaul, but then we're going to work our way up this Central Pacific campaign. Before we get to the actual day, right, the, uh, the Hellcat made its combat de debut in September of 43, and the first airplane that it was supposedly to have shot down was one of these big flying boats, Kawanishi, four engine, low, slow, easy prey flying boats that the Hellcat first shot down. Well, as part of Operation Cartwheel, which was General MacArthur's operation in the uh, Upper Solomons and New Britain, where Rabaul was, and then moved, starting to move, uh, MacArthur kind of moved into New Guinea, more on that Southwest Pacific area. We had the Third Fleet. And under the Third Fleet, Task Force 38, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about that. We had five carriers. We had about 180 Hellcats. And this operation on Rabaul was meant to neutralize and isolate Rabaul because we were going to bypass it. The strategic decision was made, uh, we're not going to invade that part of the island of New Britain. We're going to bypass it. But to do that, we have to neutralize it so it doesn't eat our flank. Okay, so the Hellcats got involved in day-long fights with airplanes in and around the Rabaul area because Rabaul was a huge hub of the Japanese Navy and Army, and they claimed nearly 50 downed airplanes for the loss of just a few Hellcats. So one of the very early um, indications that the Hellcat was more than a match for the Zero. Okay, here are some Dash 3s, the first production model. This is Captain, nope, not Captain, Lieutenant Hamilton McWhorter. Nice uh, sketch. He was the first Hellcat ace. Five kills made you an ace. Okay, now we're going to move more into the central and terrible Tarawa. So this was part of Operation Galvanic. You can see 
uh, Tarawa, a map of Tarawa up here, the atolls, and the red indicates really where the fighting went on. And most of it was on this western red area here, the island of uh, BTO. So it was the invasion of the Gilberts. It was the first U.S. offensive in the Central Pacific. We'd already done Guadalcanal. Okay, that campaign had already come and gone. We took some lumps, but we got our feet on the ground and we'd won the campaign in Guadalcanal. Well, this is the first offensive in the Central Pacific, right? Almost exclusively Navy. Okay, so now we're Fifth Fleet, Task Force 58. We have those same five carriers, about 180 Hellcats. And in these two days of the air war, the Navy uh, Hellcat pilots claimed about 30 zeros for the loss of one Hellcat. Of note, on a couple days after the main fighting, we lost Commander O'Hare. So during this battle, the Japanese were doing night attacks on the task force. And we didn't have, other than um, early emerging radar on the carriers, we didn't have a good technique, we didn't have the procedures to find the enemy aircraft at night and shoot them down. So they started experimenting with two Hellcats, kind of welded wing on an Avenger, the torpedo plane, and the torpedo plane, the Avenger, had an early radar in it. And that was the concept that they were starting to build. We let the radar on the Avenger find these enemy airplanes as they're attacking the carriers at night. And then we have the Hellcats there to, to deal some death and destruction. Well, it was during the, uh, the, early, the early parts of making that a usable concept that we lost Commander O'Hare. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this fast carrier task force. So the CONOPS, how did this fast carrier task force develop? Well, this gentleman, Admiral, Admiral Mitcher, uh, had a pretty fertile ground on which to brainstorm and come up with a, a strategy and a CONOPS. Well, one, you know, kind of our strategy early war, we needed to stem the tide. So those, you know, historians on the early parts of the war uh, wasn't going very good for the Allies. So we needed to stay in that defensive crouch, um, augment forces where we needed to. Remember, we're fighting over in Europe as well. So where do we, we have one tank and one ship and one airman and one Marine. How are we going to fight this thing? Okay, so we had to stem the tide. Then we needed to seize the initiative and go offensive, and from there, we're gonna annihilate. So that was roughly the strategy, early war, and in addition to that, lots and lots of money. Lots and lots of money coming into the military, obviously, and that allowed, again, a fertile ground for Admiral Mitcher and his planning staff to develop this fast carrier task force. Well, it started off with just a task force, which you kind of just saw, those first couple slides, key battles, five carriers. By the time we get to the last battle we're going to talk about, we had 17 carriers. So we went from a task force to a task force with subordinate task groups. We had two gentlemen, Bill Halsey, Bull Halsey. When he was in charge of the fleet, it was called Third Fleet. Spruance, Spruance was given credit for kind of the hero of Midway. And when he was in charge, it was called the Fifth Fleet. Same men and women, same ships, same aircraft. They just changed the designation. Third Fleet, Fifth Fleet. Why? So that while Halsey in the Third Fleet was out doing the, doing the combat, Spruance and his staff was back at Pearl Harbor planning the next major operation. And then they would swap. And Halsey and his staff goes back to Pearl Harbor and plans the subsequent uh, engagements. So there's our buddy Mitcher. He ended up being the task force commander. Under Halsey, it was task force 38. 
Under Spruance, it was task 458. Here are the task groups. Once we started building those carriers, the number of carriers, then we ended up with four different task groups, uh, 38-1 or 58-1, all the way to task group 38 or 58.4. They all had admirals commanding the task groups with a task force commander and then the fleet commander. And this is typical that the task group would have four carriers. No, we plussed it up as, we, as our production kicked in. And a carrier, one carrier, would have about 90 airplanes on it. And of those, about 36 of them were Hellcats. Later in the war, that changed as the operational need required a change. Okay, so the rough aircraft inside this, oh, and I don't want to leave out Nimitz, he was uh, commander of the entire Pacific Fleet. Uh, rough aircraft on these carriers, the fighter was the Hellcat, the dive bomber was a Dauntless and got replaced in 44 by the Hell Diver, and then the level or torpedo, torpedo bomber was the Avenger, which we kind of talked about, right, that big thing with the uh, big bay that would hold or tor a torpedo or a bunch of bombs. Typical missions that the Hellcats would fly, a combat air patrol. So that task force in the center of it is the carriers arrayed. They're not right next to each other. They're 10 to 15 miles apart from each other, two to three to four carriers. And then you ring that with the battleships, you ring that with the cruisers, and you ring that with the destroyers. And as we progress through the combat, uh, through the war in the Pacific, all of those surface ships ended up getting more and more and more anti-aircraft guns on them. And now stack on top of those, the Hellcats, flying combat air patrol. So they would take off, join up, and they would move, they wouldn't fly right over the carriers. They would fly out anywhere from about 15 to 50 miles from the carrier and establish their caps primarily in the direction that they expected the enemy to come to, come from. So that's combat air patrol, defensive, protect the task force. Uh, the pure fighter, in the video that we're gonna show, uh, they talk about a pure fighter, so that's when the Hellcats would take off and they didn't have to protect any bombers or torpedo planes or the carrier. They were given a, a location and said, go to that location, it's just you, and sweep the skies of any enemy airplanes, either in the air or on the ground, straight from on the ground. And then there's sweep and escort, and that's where they would go somewhere, they have a target, but they're gonna be escorting the strike package, the bombers, the Dauntlesses, and the Avengers. And they would be either out in front of them, sweep, anywhere from a couple minutes to 15 minutes, to try and clear the skies of enemy airplanes before the strikers got there, or escort, where they're more embedded or right with the strike package. Training, want to talk a little bit about training. That was a huge impact. Not just this great fast carrier task force and the greatness of the airplane, but our training program, especially by uh, 1943, about halfway through the war, it was showing that our training program was much more conducive to a longer, protracted war of attrition than the Japanese training program. So the poor Japanese fighter pilots, in particular, they got assigned a mission, or sorry, a squadron, and they were pretty much in that squadron until they were killed or the war ended. Whereas we, in large part due to production, and our vast resources, we would bring a whole unit, a whole squadron out of combat, replace it with another, and now those combat veterans who are back stateside are training the new guys. Combat lesson learned, training the new guys. That was invaluable. Okay, so that's the Fast Carrier Task Force and kind of the foundation that unleashes this thing. Okay, so now we're at truck. At the time, a feared location and 
uh, enemy stronghold, at least that's what we thought it was. We wiped them out in the air and on the ground. Okay, so now we're going to move up to the Marianas. And this is, this is not the Battle of Saipan and the Battle of the Philippine Sea, not yet. But this is the Marianas, and this is, I'm jumping ahead, right? So far, these battles that we've talked about have shown the effectiveness and the power of this fast carrier task force and how successful it has been so far. Take this hugely powerful entity, and now we're starting to get task groups so you can split them. <clears throat> and they can, they can just maraud around the Pacific, wreaking havoc. So they took advantage of that. So you can see the Gilberts, that was Tarawa. We've done the Marshalls. Uh, you can see those uh, atolls. The Carolinas, that was the truck battle we just saw. And now we're in the Marianas, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. <clears throat> so on some of these, this was just the task force coming back in the vicinity to to go back to where the Marines were on the ground. And they said, hey, we're in the vicinity of the Marianas, so let's launch some attacks. Okay, so here's that fifth fleet, so Spruance, his task force. So we went from, you know, the end of November was Rabal, and early February was Truck, and now we have 10 carriers about 360 Hellcats. And we caught them, complete surprise, and 100 plus Japanese Navy aircraft destroyed. And so far, the Japanese have had no answer to this marauding task force. Where is it going? I don't know. Where is it right now? We don't know. But here come their airplanes right now. <laughs> Okay, so now we're gonna go fast forward a couple months and now this is the Battle of Saipan. So the invasion of Saipan by the Marines and the Army and that led to the Battle of the Philippine Sea, which is the aerial battle as part of those invasion of the Marianas Islands. So Spruance is still uh, leading it. So we just went from February with 10 carriers and now we're just, what, three or four months later, and we have 15 carriers. And we have about 500 of these beasts behind me. And it's about this time that the Dash 5 is becoming operational and in numbers in the fleet. It has the more powerful engine, same 2800, Dash 10, but they added the Dash 10W, which is water injection and that gave it an extra couple horsepower, and everything counts. They streamlined the cowling and improved. They put this, if you look at ours, get a good look at ours, a flat, bulletproof, armor-resistant windscreen right in front of my nose. Okay, and in day one, this is very interesting, uh, kind of an eye chart down here on the bottom of the air battle, but the Japanese, naval airplanes had an advantage over ours. They had longer range. So they could go out to about 300 nautical miles, attack, and then get back the 300 miles to the carrier, their carriers. Our ranges was about 250 miles that our airplanes could safely go out, attack, and come back. So the Japanese had the first punch. But what it allowed our task force to do, our task groups by this time, was they knew where we, each other knew where we were. We knew we were about 300 miles. We knew, we knew we would be defensive until we closed that gap, but that they could attack us. So that allowed the commanders to put more of the Hellcats in the caps, combat air patrols, protecting the task force. We also had radar. Here they come. We also had developed the FDOs, fighter direction officers. Somebody on the boat looking at the radar, telling the Hellcats where to go. Very efficient. A an expansion of what the British did in the Battle of Britain. 
radars, observers. It was much more efficient way to use your fighters. So we wiped them out. We just wiped them out. So here comes the first wave and the second wave and the third wave of the Japanese strike aircraft. Our strike, strike aircraft went the other way went east on the other side of Saipan because they couldn't make it to the Japanese carriers. So we had Hellcats and a lot of them and we wiped them out. So on the first day, 346 Japanese aircraft claimed as destroyed and we lost 23. And after the second day of the war, now we are, we've closed the distance, and now we can start sending strike aircraft and Hellcats with the strike package. Plus we have the Hellcats over the task groups, protecting them. In total, about 450 Japanese aircraft were destroyed. We didn't, we sunk three of their carriers, certainly by this time in the war, so this is mid-44. The carrier is unquestionably the boat of, of uh, choice, not the battleships anymore, it's the carriers. So we only destroyed three of their nine, but look how many aircraft we destroyed, and how good is a carrier without carrier airplanes. Okay, now we're going up to Formosa, present day Taiwan. So again, this was a preamble to um, Leyte Gulf, the invasion of the Philippines. So again, that marauding task force or task groups, go where you need to go. Japanese don't know where you're coming from. So more of that marauding power. So now Halsey's in charge, now it's Third Fleet. Again, same boats, same airplane, same fighting men and women, but now it's the Third Fleet under Halsey, Spruance is back in Pearl Harbor planning for the next operation. Holy mackerel, now we're up to 17 carriers, about 600 Hellcats. So here's a, here's a plug going back to that little brochure. Our last planned presentation for this year is about mass production. So our own uh, John Lowe, who is a master logistician, was for Northrop Grumman until he retired. He's going to talk about how did we do it? How did we turn cars into airplanes and tanks? Mass production. Come see it. So overall, about 450 Japanese losses to 89 for us. Again, we're, we're man, men, machine, moment. Okay, now we're to the invasion of Leyte and the big, huge battle of Leyte Gulf. So, on the 20th of October was when the army troops landed. MacArthur's army ground forces landed on Leyte. And it was a couple days later before the Japanese said, okay, that we know where they are. So let's gather our forces, our battle fleet, and we're gonna steam into the Philippines and have that decisive battle that they were so hanging their hats on. Our remaining forces, naval forces and naval aircraft against this task force. Okay, we still, we've got all those carriers and we have 600 of these beasts. Okay, they were crushed, right? How many, how many folks have a rough idea of the naval battle of Leyte Gulf? Okay, kind of four distinct separate battles that went on. All of them had their air battle component, but in almost all cases, they were just, we crushed their battles. So here's the first one. If, again, sorry for the eye chart. So this mess down here is where Leyte is and where Leyte Gulf is. So the first big battle was here in the Sibion Sea. The second one was this battleship versus battleship battle in Surigao Straits. The third one, here's Halsey chasing the decoy. 
right? These are all Japanese surface forces, battleships, cruisers, destroyers. The carriers are a decoy. The Japanese carriers are a decoy because they don't have any airplanes. Because we've wiped them out. Well, we ended up overwhelming air superiority, and, and then again there was this battle. This is fascinating if you, if you ever care to look for the Battle of Leyte Gulf and these four separate engagements. So anyway, um, overwhelming Allied air superiority, we again wiped them out, and on this one day, the 24th, Commander McCampbell, who we have painted our aircraft after, had nine kills in one flight. One flight. And this is him down here. This is kind of the leading aces of Fighter Squadron 15. And in the background is Mincy 3. All right, so that's, uh, that's the last of the key battles I was going to discuss because uh, it kind of set the framework, right? What, what happened after Leyte Gulf? Well, then there was Iwo Jima, and then there was Okinawa. But if we kind of back up a couple slides and the, that formidable development of this fast carrier task force and that the Japanese had no real answer for it from an operational and tactical perspective, one of the criteria that led to the kamikazes. We have no answer for this fast carrier task force. So they had to brainstorm. What's our situation? What are our aircraft and our capabilities? How are we going to stop this? And one of their answers was the kamikaze missions. So our Hellcat, <clears throat> pardon me, right, credited with destroying over 5,200 airplanes, the most of any fighter aircraft, not just naval, but fighter aircraft. 19 to 1 kill ratio is what you read about in, uh, in the history books. Uh, some aces of note. Robert Duncan down here, bottom left, he was the first to shoot down a zero in a Hellcat. We've talked about uh, McCor McHorter, Hamilton. McWhorter was the first Hellcat ace. Alex Verashu, we saw him in the YouTube video. They had quite a few talks with him. He also, he had 19 kills. We were also able, um, Navy uh, Air Facility El Centro down in Southern California. <clears throat> We've taken our aircraft, not just the Hellcat, but several of our aircraft to their air shows over the years. So they knew we had a Hellcat and they had made the decision they were gonna rename their field Verashu Field after Alex Verashu. So they asked us to bring the Hellcat down. We did. We made a little presentation. His family was there. It was really cool. So we were part of the Navy renaming uh, the field after a Hellcat ace. And then there's a picture on the bottom uh, right of Commander McCampbell. He was the highest scoring Navy ace, 34 kills. So that made, got him the uh, uh, the moniker of, is that the right word? The, the name, the nickname, Ace of Aces. Okay, so that's our Hellcat flying around. Not a pleasant view if you're a Japanese airman. So we're gonna try again with the multimedia and I got a little bit of Hellcat gun camera footage. There's no sound. That's one of those big Kawanishi flying boats. Here's a little bit more.
you look closely on the bottom of some of these last ones, you almost see a small set of wings underneath the fuselage. <clears throat> see the wings? You can barely see the small set of wings. Look closely. That was the Oka, so that's later in the war. That's that rocket-powered, I'm forgetting if it's guided or if it's got a pilot in it, rocket-powered, dropped from the bombers, and then rocket-powered means it's much, much faster than these propeller-driven airplanes. And one of the late war um, weapons developments of the Japanese. Okay, so as I mentioned up front, uh, we had the opportunity to, to take our Hellcat all the way to Atlanta, Georgia for an air show there. They really wanted a Hellcat, didn't they? Okay, well, we gave it to them, thanks to this guy back here, Jason, he arranged it all, and we were able to go. So uh, uh, it was a great trip, and the Hellcat was magnificent, and so I thought we'd share a little bit of it. So there's the four flight picture, screenshot, right? Here's Camarillo over here. IFP is Laughlin Bullhead. AEG is Albuquerque. PWA is Wiley Post Airport in Oklahoma City. OLV is Olive Branch Airport just outside Memphis. And PDK is Peachtree DeKalb Airport right outside Atlanta. So about 3,600 miles round trip, about 1,200 gallons of gas the aircraft burned. It's not efficient. Well, efficient is maybe not the right word. Certainly with $7 a gallon gas, ab gas, 1,200, roughly 1,200, about uh, 17 hours of flight time round trip. I got two uh, air show flights in. I did a, a tail chase on the Kate which is the, uh, the Japanese Pearl Harbor vintage torpedo bomber. So many of our battleships were damaged or destroyed by torpedoes dropped by a cape. Well, that's a replica cape, but it's got a torpedo. We have one in the hangar over here. So let's go back to what I talked about when we turn you loose for your taking out uh, or taking an opportunity to look at our other displays. Go take a look at our cape. Okay, and then a, a Wildcat joined up. So there's the predecessor, F4F, F6F. And then the second sortie of the uh, flight, uh, there was a six ship gaggle of uh, warbirds that just kind of did roundy rounds, as we call them, racetrack pattern. And in the end, the Hellcat and the Wildcat joined up on a Sky Raider, an A1, Marine Corps called them the AD Sky Raider. So let's look at some photos. Okay, Hellcat, this is on the Double Eagle Airport just outside Albuquerque. We had to make a stop because of weather, a little bit shy of Memphis. So we dropped into Searcy, Arkansas. And we had a little bit of an oil issue. And these are three gentlemen who, who do maintenance at that airport and they were just awesome. They jumped in like you wouldn't believe. Volunteers, just like we are. And they jumped in and they helped us identify and fix a couple oil leaks, which then allowed, there's a pretty uh, basking in the uh, sunset, and it really facilitated and allowed us to get the aircraft all the way to Atlanta. So we made it. So a picture from uh, one of the air show spectators and somehow it, it makes its way to me. So this is, uh, oops. Uh, so that's uh, Mincy 3 looking really nice, flying in the show. Come on, there's another one, you saw that. 
and there's a, a picture uh, of that six ship gaggle. Well, several of the airplanes landed. You saw that we uh, joined with the Sky Raider, who's on the right side, he's leading it, then the Hellcat, then the Wildcat. And I'm sorry again, I just couldn't figure out how to make the picture bigger, but I still think you can see the size difference between the Wildcat, the F-4, and the Hellcat, the F-6. It's Big Brother. Okay, other than those oil issues, the only thing that really happened to this airplane after that 17 hours, 3,600, was one of the Japanese flags peeled off. Oh, but that's how well this thing flew. Say hello to Roger. I wouldn't have named a Roadrunner Roger, but... So coming back, we had to land at uh, Laughlin Bullhead Air Airport that's on the Colorado River, about an hour south of Las Vegas. Um, to get some gas. And while we were waiting for things to work out, Roger shows up. And he's there to get his daily hot dog from the right there. He's gotten all the lizards, so now he's into hot dogs. I think that's it. So let me get some video. Bear with me. All right, that's our GPS. So I'm at 9,500 feet. I'm doing 200 knots. I've got 30 inches of manifold pressure. Oh, went too fast. We're running about 2,000 RPM on the propeller. This is our first leg. And I'm roughly a beam Victorville. Headed east. I'm going to save you from the shakiness. As you know, you've got to fly with one hand and film with the other. So here, someone tell me what this is. Meteor crater. A big meteor crater right outside Winslow, Arizona. So this is that cap. So now the Hellcat is capping over the mighty Mississippi River. I've got my 650 caliber machine guns. We're loaded for bear because the Hellcat could, could carry 400 rounds per gun, 2,400 bullets fully loaded. Heavy, heavy firepower. Mighty Mississippi River. Here's that cape. So this is at Peachtree. Just a real quick uh, video. This is the air show. So that's the um, replica Kate torpedo bomber that I'm going to fly with, chase around a little bit, make it look like I shoot him down. And we're just getting ready for our time slot to take off. This is what a thunderstorm looks like when you're at 8,500 feet. So I wanted to land in the Memphis area, but I couldn't either going or coming because of thunderstorms. So that was a big thunderstorm sitting off there over Memphis and I had to go around it and okay, no big deal. Other than Memphis didn't get to see the Hellcat. So my wing leader said, have some fun. So this is, uh, you know, maintaining cloud clearances. This is passing a cumulus cloud at 230 miles an hour. If you look closely, downtown Oklahoma City. So you can see really nice visibility, great weather. That certainly helped going across country twice in a short period of time. This is uh, coming back. So now we're westbound. That's Winslow, Arizona. So we kind of saw the area previously with the crater, meteor crater. 
So you can see uh, that's our GPS. It kind of showed Flagstaff is up ahead. That's the painted desert. The colors didn't pop out quite as nicely as they did to my eyeballs. I think this one's a little more striking. That's Flagstaff. That's hum Humphreys Peak, the dormant volcano just outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. And who's been to Sedona, Arizona? Gorgeous place. So it, it's nothing like being there, but if you let the camera focus there, there south of Flagstaff, you can start to see the, the, the beautiful rock formations. All right, we're getting closer to home. So the San Gabriel Mountains right there. So Victorville is right behind the Hellcat. And if you let it focus, that's Edwards Air Force Base out in the desert. And as good as the visibility was, what I'm trying to show is there's the Pacific Ocean on the other side of the Santa Monica Mountains there. And it just didn't pop out, right? A little bit hazy over the water, even though it was clear as can be over land here. Yeah, just really couldn't see the water, which is what I was hoping to do. Okay, one of my favorites here, this was taken, this is a Hellcat taking off out of the uh, airport in Atlanta, Georgia. So listen to this engine and watch the main landing gear retract backwards. Love this video. is back here. So we land back here after this journey. Wonderful aircraft and uh, here's what I had to say. So hello again. Here we are back in the hangar. There's that magnificent Hellcat and I'm back on the CAF SoCal ramp at the Camarillo Airport. So what a trip. Uh, roughly 3,600 miles, uh, 1,200 gallons of gas. Uh, some shout outs and kudos to the CAF SoCal uh, maintenance department uh, for just having this aircraft in such great condition and the ops team for, you know, training and uh, having operational procedures to uh, fly this airplane well. Uh, overall, the weather was great and really kind of enabled the trip on a fairly tight timeline. A little issues with Memphis, but we uh, worked it out. Uh, I want to shout out again the uh, guys at Searcy Airport in Searcy, Arkansas, William and Jeremy and David for really jumping in and helping us with uh, an oil issue. And uh, also uh, thanks a lot to the team at the air show at Peachtree DeKalb Airport for really treating us, uh, the airplane and me, really well. And my last thing is there is no doubt that my ass is flatter now than it was last Wednesday. See ya. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Okay, the Grumman aircraft, or the Grumman Hellcat. So, all the way back to slide one or two, you know, man slash men in the cockpit, man being mature and developing that fast carrier task force with the Hellcat on it and the Pacific War. Man, machine, moment. Questions? Yes, sir. Man, machine. What about uh, Japanese versus American aviators versus machine? Uh, had a lot to do with the early war. The, at the start of the war, before the Hellcat, the Japanese had, without a doubt, the best naval aviators on the planet. And that showed. 
they had a wonderful, uh, a magnificent training program, but it was not built, it was not structured for a protracted war of attrition. So they did not have the hundreds, if not thousands, of pilots being trained at home to supplement the combat units. So you stayed in a combat unit as a Japanese fighter pilot, really any of them, until you were killed or you were wounded such you couldn't fly anymore or the war ended. Where we had the training pipeline, so all these combat veterans, Duncan and Vrashu and McCampbell would rotate back to the States and train the young guys. I'm listening to an audio book about the Battle of Saipan. And there's, you know, they, it's mostly about the ground war, but they inter intersperse a lot about the, the big carrier battle, Battle of the Philippine Sea. And at that point in the war, there's still a year left in the war, but your average fighter or Japanese pilot might have as little as 20 hours in their airplane where our guys flying there, joining the carrier units, would have upwards of 200 hours of just training. That's just the training pipeline before you get into an operational unit. And part of that, and I think I omitted that when we were talking about the Fast Carrier Task Force and the training aspect, was gunnery training was huge. So a Navy pilot goes through pilot training and he gets his wings. And then he gets picked at what aircraft you're gonna go fly. All right, you're gonna go fly a Hellcat. So now he goes to Hellcat training, learn how to fly the Hellcat. And he's gonna get 100 to 120 hours in the Hellcat. And a lot of that is gunnery training. Where the poor Japanese pilot is really not even able to navigate over these long distances. So a lot of the zero pilots, especially later in the war, they have to have a, a, um, an aircraft, usually one of the twin engine bombers, do the navigation for them so they could get to the fight. So they're working really hard to safely take off and land the airplane. So I hope I answered your question. So training was a huge piece, huge piece. She had her hand up. I was just wondering what elevation you uh, on your oxygen. No, we didn't use oxygen. Um, we typically fly at 80, we're typically VFR, right? Day VFR airplane. So we're flying 8,500, westbound or 9500 eastbound. Uh, we may, I, I bumped it up a little bit. The terrain in and around Albuquerque is pretty high. So we like to have some out, some airspace below us because this is anything but a glider, <laughs> right? So you wanna have enough altitude. So I climbed up uh, pretty much on the east side of, of Albuquerque. So I 11.5 going east. I went all the way up to 12.5, I don't need oxygen up there. And as soon as I can, I come down. As soon as the terrain gets lower, I'm gonna get lower too. As long as I have enough air, uh, gliding room to get to a piece of concrete or a farmer's field or a dry wash or whatever it's gonna take. Um, orange shirt. Yeah, one of those, uh, that, that metal sticking up from the calorie. So, yeah. Those are cowl flaps. Cowl flaps, okay? In this airplane, they are hydraulically driven. They're typically open on the ground because there's not a lot of airflow coming through. So they're really there to help control the temperature of the engine. If you noticed um, on a lot of my videos, when I brought the camera through the nose of the airplane, they were closed because there's enough airflow coming through the, the front of the engine to keep the cylinders cool. Yes, sir. I have a question. 
that that only carries one person, not two, just one. And my last question, does any of the agencies have both voice ports in them, or are they all American? Uh, the I doubt that it's got Rolls-Royce parts in it, right? It was built by Pratt & Whitney, and somebody else helped me, right? Was it General Motors? There was a car company that built engines too, right? Remember, we went all in. So there weren't any toasters being built. Everybody was building something, bullets, ships, aircraft, engines. So I don't think this thing, you know, built by Pratt & Whitney or um, I want to say General Motors was also, you know, building these engines under license agreement and uh, they would have been able to source parts in, inside the country. Yeah. With a lot of these hackers built yes. on the that, that That's a good point. So, um, you know, Rolls-Royce built the, the the famous Merlin engine that went in a lot of the British airplanes and our Mustang. And then we license built, Packard license built the Merlin engine here in the States so that all of our Mustangs had Packard built Merlin engines. And yeah, that, those certainly would have had Rolls Royce parts in it. How do you get out of well, I'm not going to bring him up here because he talks way too much. But Lon back here is an expert at our airplane. So this airplane behind me, sorry Mike, sorry. Here. This airplane um, was produced, came off the plant in July of 45, so it did not see combat. It did go up into the Great Lakes area where we were doing, still doing a lot of that Hellcat training. So all of our young pilots, um, but it didn't stay in the Navy inventory very long because like, what was the title of our program? Short life and violent. So in, in two to three years, this thing went from a frontline fighter to second rate duty. Because at the end of the war, the Bearcat is now getting into the fleet in numbers. And what's right behind the Bearcat? Jets. So the, the Hellcat didn't stay in frontline service for very long. Short life. Okay, so this aircraft got um, figuratively kicked over the side and donated, uh, I think it was for $100, to an airport in Minnesota, Fergus Field, Minnesota. And it stayed there kind of like a gate guard or as you drive onto the airport, there's a Hellcat. And it ended up being target practice for, you know, the young kids with 22s. Uh, and then the CAF got it in 61. And then it's gone through several restorations and you know we've we've had this here for uh, 20 years ish in this state so that last restoration i believe was early to mid 90s the restoration that ended up looking like this we painted it in this current scheme after commander mccampbell and there you go i hope i answered the question yes sir is it hard to learn how to fly it no it's, it's an easy airplane to fly. It's very docile. So that's where I'm amazed at the, if it's the right word, the dichotomy between the ruggedness and lethality of this airplane in the day and how easy it is to fly. Very easy to fly. Very easy to fly. Yes, sir. Does it have an autopilot? <laughs> no. You can trim it up, you know, if you have a, a good air mass that's fairly calm, you can trim this thing up pretty well to where you can take hands off for a couple minutes. But that's about it. That's about it. Questions? Yes, sir. Classified. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know the details. They took care of me while I was there. 
right? They put gas in it when I said, can you give me gas? They gave me a jug of oil when I said, can I have some oil? I'm, I'm sorry? Did not. Single ship. So thank you, maintenance department and ops department for training me how to fly the airplane right, for maintaining it in this wonderful condition. Yes, we had an oil problem where these are oil-based machines. That engine is going to leak oil, period. So an oil issue, having a little bit more, is not grossly out of bounds from to be expected. And as I mentioned, other than that oil thing, the only problem with the airplane was one of the stickers came off of it. Yes, ma'am. Do we have any Navy veterans from 40s or 50s that flew Hellcats? There, there are, yeah, there are not a lot of them around. Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> Machine guns, are they individually operated or go full blast? You get them all. Yes, they, you know, they have their own um, ammo belts, obviously, I don't mean to say something stupid, but they have their own uh, ammo belts. It was a very ingenious, they had a box, and it's full of three belts of 50 caliber ammunition. So they just take the empty one out, and they put this one in, and then they feed it. And that's why you see the gun staggered a little bit. That's because, you know, what's the fat part of a machine gun? The breech. So if you put them all like this, you got to separate them. And that's all part of aeronautical engineering, is where do we put these guns and ammo in the wing, and how do we stagger them? It all drives that engineering thing, and it affects maneuverability and mass and moment and all that. Well, if you stagger them, if you choose to, you can put them closer together. And so, um, did I answer your question? No, I didn't, sorry. So yeah, when, you, when you, you arm the thing up, they were hydraulically driven by the hydraulic system. But when you armed them up and you sque squeezed the trigger, you got all six of them if they were all working, all six. So that's firepower, you know, the 50, uh, the zero had a, a small number rounds per gun of the 20 millimeter. And the 20 millimeter is roughly an 80, 80 caliber. That's huge. But the 50 caliber was still a lot of weight. So think about the mass coming out of these guns when all six are firing these 50 caliber slugs. That's a lot of firepower. And um, we talked about the Japanese pilots and their training. Look at their airplanes too. Let's go back to the Battle of the Philippine Sea. The Navy had, or sorry, the Japanese Navy had longer range, so they could strike first. But that cost them in the design of their airplane. How much armor was in the Zero? So they were tinder boxes. So take this 50 caliber six guns, well, that's eight, isn't it? Six guns firing these 50 caliber slugs into a fragile airplane. That, now I answered your question. Okay. Yes, sir. Looks very bulky compared to a zero or a it, it is, you know, it's, wish I had a, a, a photo of, you know, the two together, because we have a flying zero, pulled out of the jungles and restored. And there are great photos of them together, and you can see the size difference between the Zero and the Hellcat. And without making this about the Zero, all the way to the end of the war, none of our aircraft, no Allied aircraft, could turn with a Zero. And by turning, I mean you set your wings and you pull. And around and around you go. And what matters when you're doing a turning fight Re relatively horizontal, but matters is turn rate, 
how fast am I going around this plate, and turn radius, how small is my plate. And what do you want? You want the best of both worlds. I want the smallest plate, turn radius, and I want to run around it, as opposed to a big plate that I'm going to walk around. Well, none of us could, fight, could turn, so we didn't. We learned the hard way, the wildcats. So that's why Commander O'Hare goes to Grumman and says, give me more power. I want to climb, and I want to run away, or I want to catch him. So our engine technology, there's a quote from a, a, a Japanese fighter pilot who survived. And, you know, he was asked some kind of question, what's the one thing you wish you would have had? And he said, I wish we would have progressed more with more powerful engines. We did. I'll take one more. I'm, I'm running long here. I'll take one more question or, yes, sir. Can you be objective? What do you prefer, the Mustang or the Hellcat to fly? <laughs> um, no, I cannot be objective. I've come up with an answer that I like, though, and that is the last airplane I flew is my favorite. They're, they're, they're all just, um, I'm at the point now where it, the nostalgia of what I'm doing uh, is, is huge, right? Yeah, I want to operate it right. I want to bring it back safely in one piece, and I want to uh, take care of it, right? I'm charged with that. But, but the nostalgia of, you know, what, look at what I'm doing and think about the other, the, the 24 year olds who sat in this and took off on a pitching deck in the, at night and lived or died. Okay, thank you. Hope I answered your question. Okay, I have a wrap up. Thank you very much for all your questions. That was great. So we're gonna wrap this thing up. So uh, another pitch and a blow to the, to the chin Look at your little brochure there. Come see us again in early August, about two months. We're going to talk about our PBJ. And uh, we're going to talk about the 77th uh, anniversary of VJ Day. And we're going to talk about how that airplane did low altitude treetop, literally treetop attacks, and how they went through the war continuously modifying their ordnance, their guns, their uh, bombs to accomplish the mission. And then a month after that, roughly, we're gonna talk about the Battle of Britain and our Spitfire. Thanks very much for your time. Really appreciate you being here and have a great day.